Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plots Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Certain plants can be planted together and they will help each other out. It is companion planting and we're going to talk about it. Also, squash is a garden favorite. Today we're going to learn all about it. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Tanya Ashworth. Tanya is our local garden expert. And Walter Battle is here. Walter is a UT County Director in Haywood County. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for, Thanks having, for having us. us. All right, Tanya, let's talk a little bit about companion planting. And I get a lot of questions about companion planting. Mm -hmm. So first of all, what is it? Companion planting simply means that you're planting two different crops near okay. each other and you're trying to influence uh, pests pressure, mm -hmm. maybe reduce insects, or uh, get better yields, better tasting fruit, something yeah. like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, can you give us some examples, because that's what folks want to know. Right. Some good examples. Well, uh, companion planting, the most famous example is from uh, Native American history. Oh, okay. uh, many, many years ago, the Native Americans figured out that they could grow uh, vegetables in a companion planting setting okay. and get good results. And they called it the three sisters. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So they would grow corn, beans, and squash together. Um, the corn would provide support for the beans to climb. Mm -hmm. And the squash at the bottom of the plant would provide shade and weed suppression for the plants okay. and um, would help with moisture, uh, moisture loss prevention. And then the prickles on the squash would keep the raccoons <laughs> out of the corn. Right. And also, because those beans uh, fix atmospheric nitrogen, it provided a nitrogen source for the corn. And corn's a heavy feeder, so mm -hmm. they really had this thing figured out. Yeah, I tell folks that all the time. I mean, they really figured that thing out. And Walter, you talked about that, the three sisters sure. uh, time or two, I've heard. Yes, yes, you know, in the Master Garden, right. I'll, talk, I'll, I'll talk about that. He sure does. All right, mm -hmm. good deal. So how can a home gardener know which combinations to try? Because of course they wouldn't want to try this. Right. right. Well, unfortunately, if you just <laughs> simply go on the internet and, uh -huh. and type in companion planting, you're going to get a whole bunch of information and maybe some of it's not right. Actually, <laughs> a lot of it may not be okay. right. Good. There were um, a lot of lists circulated through the 1960s and 70s, wow. and it's like this plant likes this other plant and dislikes this plant. Okay. Um, and if you see a list like that, it's, it's, most of it has been uh, debunked by research okay. in, the, in the last couple, three decades. So those aren't reliable. But there have been a few combinations that have kind of withstood the scrutiny of the research. Mm -hmm. So one of those is basil, basil and tomatoes. Uh -huh. Now, basil and tomatoes taste great together on the plate, and they also <laughs> wow. are really good to plant together in the garden. Uh -huh. <laughs> For some reason, basil, when planted with tomato, will give you uh, better yield in your tomato plants, and you could also get better taste in fruit. Okay. And the basil will keep away thrifts and help control the hornworms. Um, another one you can try, same kind of concept as the three sisters, mm -hmm. is planting your potatoes with your beans or peas. Because potatoes like a lot of nitrogen, and right. the beans and peas fix the nitrogen right. and put it back into the soil for the potatoes. Mm -hmm. And then also onions. Um, the aroma yeah. of the onions kind of can keep away some insects. And so one of those is onions and carrots. Right. If you put onions you know. and carrots together, um, the onion can kind of keep away uh, the carrot fly. Sure, sure. I've heard that one. You heard some of those before too? Yeah, I've, I've heard of some of those, uh -huh. but that's a new one on me, the, the, the carrot fly with the onions mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. carrots. That's, that's a new one. That's, that's good stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, but this is one we always hear about though. What about planting those marigolds? Yes, so what about that? that's probably the most common uh -huh. uh, one that people that people will try. And um, you know, marigolds can um, get rid of nematodes, soil nematodes okay. in your in your garden. However, if you really have a nematode problem that you're trying to use marigold, marigolds to control, it's better to plant your marigolds a season or two before. Oh so that they can kind of have time to get rid of the nematodes. So it's, you get the best results not with a true companion planting. So if you plant them at the same time as the rest of the crops in your garden, you're not going to get as good a control. So it's not wow. a true companion plant to get the best results. Now, if you want to try that, there's some cultivars that um, work better for that, like okay. Nima Gold, um, 
Golden Guardian, uh, things that have NEMA in the title. Okay. <laughs> right. So, right. Right. That gives you an idea. Marigolds, yeah, right. that, that'll take care of the nematode problems. And, you know, there's been a study um, with uh, marigolds thinking that they could uh, ward off some insect right. pests. I was going to ask you about that. Okay. Yeah, okay. so... Um, some researchers planted green beans, some okay. next to marigolds and some not next to marigolds to see if they could control the Mexican bean beetle. Oh, okay. As it turns out, the, the beans near the marigolds had fewer bean beetles, but they also what? produced fewer green beans because <laughs> the marigolds can um, exude a chemical to inhibit the growth of other plants oh. near them kind of like an allelopathic right, situation. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, marigolds can try to reduce competition by stunting other plants' growth, and that's what it did with the with the beans. So you kind of have to be careful, uh -huh. you, you know, when you're going to use marigolds. So yes, it did control the beetle, right. but you didn't but get the result that you wanted. Who told you that's good? I did not know that. Yeah. Okay. So, but you need to plant the marigolds again, what, a couple of seasons before? Before before to get the nematode control to, to, you know, really get the nematodes out of there. How about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because folks are running out now to the, you know, to the stores, nurseries, yeah. big box stores, to plant the marigolds. Yeah. Yeah, thinking that, yeah, if I plant on this season, they'll get rid of all the bugs for this season. But maybe not. But maybe not. Yeah. Yeah, but they'll be in good shape two years yeah, from now. Yeah, two years yes. from now. <laughs> How about that, though? That's, that's good stuff. Okay. Uh, is there a big picture idea for the home gardener regarding companion planting? Yes, I'd say the big picture with companion planting is you want to think polyculture instead right. of monoculture. Okay. So poly just means many. Right. So you can kind of confuse your insects when they're <laughs> flying by. They're trying to find their favorite host plant. Right. And if you have uh, kind of a jumble of stuff out there, you've got things mixed together instead of just everything in nice, neat little sections or a grid or a row. If you've got things mixed up that has different aromas, different mm. bloom times, different ripening times, you can kind of confuse or they'll maybe miss or overlook their favorite host plant. And I've successfully hidden parsley in my garden okay. from uh, caterpillars by putting it in the middle of a whole bunch of other things okay. and making it a little bit harder for the caterpillars to find. So, so it actually worked out pretty good for you. Yeah. So think polyculture mm -hmm. instead of monoculture. And then the other thing you can do is plant lots of flowers, okay. which I, I always love to plant flowers anyway. But And you don't even have to plant the flowers right next to your garden. They can be a little just in the vicinity. Okay. And we call these insectaries. Mm. And so what an insectary is... It's like a nursery for your beneficial insects. Okay. So you want beneficial insects in your garden because things like ladybugs and lacewings kill your aphids um, and keep your vegetables, you know, a lower insect pressure. So right, right. you want to keep those things around. And the way you can do that, because they have wings and they can fly off if sure. there's no aphids sure. to eat. Sure. But if you have a whole bunch of different flowering plants nearby, then they can go there and um, they can, you know, pollinate and they can kind of munch on mm. stuff there. It's a place for them to live until you have a pest problem and then they'll fly over there and take <laughs> right. care of those and come back to your flowers. It's also good just to attract bees and pollinators sure. to sure your garden. Is. Sure. Mm -hmm. Wow. Tell you, it's good stuff. We appreciate that good information. Thank you much. Thank you. All right. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Walter, let's talk a little bit about squash, okay? We have a couple of questions for you. So the first one is, what are some types of squash? Well, you know, you basically have two types. You have what they call the winter squash, mm -hmm. and you have also the summer squash. And, of course, here uh, we have an example of this one. Here's a butternut squash. Mm -hmm. It's a winter squash. Uh, here's your spaghetti squash, uh, which is also a winter-type squash. And the reason it's called spaghetti squash because it has the little strands mm -hmm. that look like spaghetti. And then also one of my favorites for winter <laughs> squash is the acorn squash. And, uh, and the way I prepare those, I just cut them in half and put some raisins and cinnamon and brown sugar <laughs> in them and bake them. They're real good. <laughs> but we also have the summer squash. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's where you have your yellow squash, and there's two types of those you have like this, the straight neck, mm -hmm. yellow straight neck, and then you have the yellow crook neck. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also you have the zucchini squash, and, and there are some black zucchinis, uh, and also you have the patty pan, the little 
you know, white squash mm -hmm. and yellow squash that's kind of circular in shape. So it's all different types okay. uh, to have. Okay. So when should you plant your squash? Uh, basically May. Okay. Uh, is, is the month that you can plant them. Anytime, really, May through June, uh, you can plant squash. Uh, and also, you can plant like your renter type squash on up into like July, maybe, uh, and, and, and that'll be fine. Okay. Uh, is there a certain way we need to prepare the soil for growing squash? Yes, you want to you till it and get that good tilt, okay. a good scientific <laughs> word, tilt. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and then you want to kind of space these plants out because they love to have a lot of space. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, squash vines, they like to run. And, and so therefore, you know, you want to make sure probably a good four feet uh, row diameters, okay. uh, so to speak. Probably want to plant them about, I would say probably 24 to 36 inches apart per plant. Okay. They give them plenty of room because uh, they really, really like to have space to run. Okay. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, all your vines, right? Anything That's like right. Cucurbit Those vines. family. You know, pretty much cucurbit run. family, yes. Okay. So what is an issue you can have in growing squash? Uh, I would say one of, the, one of the big issues that I see from a disease perspective uh, would be powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. uh, you just tend to, to see it. It's, it's just uh, pops up on there, and, and, and it, it has that little, like, powdery mm -hmm. look to it. So it's kind of where it gets its name. Uh, and there are several different types of fungicides that, uh, you know, can treat it and take care of it. Uh, and then, of course, from an insect perspective, uh, I guess the real big one, uh, of course, is that old squash borer. Oh, yeah. uh, that's where your squash vine is so beautiful and pretty one day, <laughs> and then you go outside and it's just wilted. Right. It and you're collects. like, what happened? Yeah. Yes. And if you pull it up, you'll see... At the very base, you'll see these little holes uh -huh. where those boars have gone in there and, and I guess bored it out mm -hmm. and messed up all the flow of the nutrients and all that and killed the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can use products that contain like bifurthrin, I mm -hmm. guess, to, uh, you know, control mm -hmm. that. Uh, and also they do get aphids, uh, the squash bud, bug itself. Uh, it gets those as well. Okay. And I always tell folks you have to scout. You know, just look for those yes. eggs, and you can find them on the underside of the leaves. That's right, yeah. up on the underside mm -hmm. of, of, of the leaves. They, they're almost in straight rows. They look like little bronze footballs, some of them do. Oh, oh yes. They're, yeah. they're neat. They're neat they are. insects. Yeah. You know, they, they like things organized. <laughs> <laughs> they are pretty neat. no doubt about that. Uh, so how long before you can harvest those? So we have them in the ground. How long before harvest? Uh, for summer squash, you, you're looking at about 50 days. Huh? Uh, right. Before you can actually harvest, and, and and you can harvest for oh gosh, uh, a, a good good production is six weeks. Even. Wow. I've seen them last that long. You know, good good varieties can hold out that long uh, if you don't get the the, the boar. Right, sure, sure. <laughs> okay, sure. and um, and I would say your winter squash. Uh, well, it, it's a little longer for those. I, I can't remember the numbers on it, but. Uh, you might, I think it's probably about maybe 60, 70 days before you can actually harvest those. But they store for like four months. Wow, that's you know, if you, if you store them properly, mm -hmm. I mean, they'll, they'll just last forever. Okay. So when you go to, to harvest, though, how do you know they're exactly ready to be harvested? Well, I, I would say this, uh, you know, you look at this zucchini that I have here. That's probably the perfect size. Okay to harvest a zucchini. Uh, this is probably the perfect size, maybe a little smaller, to harvest yellow squash. And I will tell you, one thing about squash is, once they start producing, they don't wait on you. <laughs> that, that little squash that may be like, you know, three inches today, two inches today, that thing is like, you know, five inches tomorrow. Right. So, you know, you, you have to pretty much harvest them every other day. Okay. Uh, yes. All right, so how much squash can a person expect to produce then? Oh, uh, you can easily get probably, I know, get 75 to 100 pounds per 100 foot, uh, you know, yeah, row. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Once they're good, you, you get a good variety. You know, they, they really do great. Okay. Now, what about weed control, though? <laughs> <laughs> Folks chop, want to get out chop. there and chop, right? Yeah, want chop to control and those pull weeds. is the best yeah. thing I can tell you. Of course, you can deal with your, your grass uh, reeds, you know, your, your grasses. I, you, you can use something that contains, what's that, uh, 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 the active ingredient for products like post, you know. Okay. Yeah, you can use that to control your grasses, but okay. uh, most of your other weed issues, you just pretty much have to get out there and chop and pull. Okay. 
I just got to chop and pull, right? Yes, good exercise, though. Okay, right. Yes. And the thing you want to do, you definitely want to practice good sanitation because a lot of your, sure. your insect pests actually overwinters in that crop degree. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And, and, and that's why every year we tell people to clean your gardens, okay. you know, at the end, or, mm -hmm. you know, just go out there and till all that stuff under and let it, you know, rot and compost through the winter and be ready for use next year as a nutrient, you know. Okay. How about rotation? Now, so you're not going to plant squash in the same place all the time, are you? No, no. Okay. So next year I will probably come back uh, and plant some legume crop or something there where I had uh, my cucurbit crop the year before. You know, that's probably what I would follow it up with. Okay. All right. So obviously you like growing squash, don't you? <laughs> oh, yes, man. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a squash freak. I'm okay. A, I, I absolutely love this stuff. Okay. So you prepare mm -hmm. many different ways, I'm sure, because you told the master gardening class that. Oh time yes, too. oh yes, yes, yes. I mean, you can fry, boil, just whatever. Okay. You know, it's 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 bake in the winter squash. It's just a very versatile plant. Okay. All right. And what what about varieties? Do you have any favorite varieties that you like? Uh, to be honest with you, uh, I just basically buy the types that's at the gardening okay. center. It's not a particular brand that I okay. that I pick. It's just you know I just get those little packets of seeds and. Okay. I just go out there and go at it. Just, all right. And all the information that you would need would be on those packets of seeds? Oh, yes, yes. Just just follow the information. Uh, it's going to tell you, you know, the little zone when yeah. to plant and all that and how many days to harvest and, and spacing requirements. So, yes, yes, you'll be fine. All right. Well, Walter, we appreciate that. Yes. Thank you much. Okay, thank right. you. Okay, it's harvest time for the uh, radishes. We got some good radishes in here and we got some bad radishes. This first one right here is a good radish. It's a little split uh, and that comes from uneven rainwater. Uh, but you notice that the foliage is small, the radish is big, and that's just clean it up a little bit, cut out the bad parts and it's totally edible. We'll move along a little bit further and here is a radish that's beyond being good. Notice that it has developed, it, it's uh, bolted, and notice it's got a little seed head on it. That means that this is going to be tough and pithy, and probably best thing for it is to put it in the compost pile. And like all root crops, you want to use a low nitrogen and a high phosphorus potassium fertilizer like 6 12 12. All right, here's our QA session. Y'all ready for this? Yes. All right, we have some good questions here. Here's our first viewer email. When is the appropriate time to start planting cantaloupe and watermelons? What? May. What about that? May. The month of May. Okay. Yes. Any specific varieties that you like from either? Oh, I like all types <laughs> of them. Uh, but for cantaloupes, you have the ambrosia, which is a very good right. variety. And of course, uh, with watermelons, you have the jubilee. Uh, the Crimson Sweet. Okay. Uh, but yes, May is the May is the time to do May that. Is the time. All right. How long before harvest? You know, for cantaloupes and watermelons. Would you know that? Well, I know. Uh, uh, in our part of the world, uh, people typically are harvesting somewhere around. We, we shoot for the Fourth of July. Okay. That's what everybody shoots. So from May to July, okay, uh, gives you kind of an idea about what time. Yeah, that's probably what it's about 80, about 80, 80, 80 to 90 80, days, yeah. something like that. You know, for the most part. All right, here's our next severe email. I am trying to get a garden going again after five years. In the process of pulling up roots and stumps, I came across this plant. It has a root that is, in some instances, is perhaps eight to 10 inches across. It's very deep, perhaps more than two feet. It is not wood, but it is very pulpy. It has a broad leaf up to three feet in length. What is this plant? And this is from Jim and Raleigh. So what do y'all think that is, Tanya? Poke weed. Yeah. Poke weed. Yeah. Poke weed. You see people say, yeah, make good poke salad. Poke salad. That's what I was going to say, also that. known as poke salad. Yeah, uh -huh. poke salad. Yes. Um, I've seen it, of course, out in the wild, you know, grew mm -hmm. up in the country, so you just always see it out there in the country. It can get pretty tall. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can. Yeah. Uh, and also, you, you tend to find it around bulldozer piles. Ah, okay. And that's where you, you, okay. you'll find a lot of it, and, and people eat it. Uh -huh. uh, and I know some people say so they fry it with eggs. And, wow. All that, but once it gets to the berry stage, I think the it's, berries are the berries are poisonous. poisonous. Yeah. So you don't yeah. want to. Yeah, those uh, berries are purple, black in color. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the older parts of the plant are poisonous. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, for the most part, the younger part you can eat. 
uh, has the magenta colored stem. Yes. Uh, yes. And then the veins in between the leaves are, you know, magenta in color too. Big alternate leaves, mm -hmm. you know, on, on the pokeweed. Uh, yeah, and that thing has a very deep tap root system. Yes, it does. You know, I've tried to pull some of those out of the ground, and I mean, fleshy roots, you know, I think it's something else. But it's amazing to see. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's amazing to see. And those, again, those berries are just dark purple, black mm -hmm. in color. It's actually yeah. pretty. Mm -hmm. And I can see where yeah. a little kid might want to, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. so you wouldn't want that around you. Actually, house. my husband, when he was a little boy, ate the berries oh. and had to be taken to the hospital. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So let that be a lesson, folks. Yeah. Very poisonous. Yes. yes. All right. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so, Mr. Jim, yes, poke weed, you know, is what that is. Phytolaca americana. Okay. Is what that is. And I actually know that because, again, we used to, you know, try to pull it out of the ground all the time. And I wonder, what is this weed? This thing is incredible. Um, but there you have it. You know, if it's left undisturbed, it can get massive, mm -hmm. which we've seen in that picture. All right. So here's our next Vera email. When do you plant sweet potato slips? What is the best way to do it? And this is from Phil. Okay, the, the best time to plant them is in May and June. Okay. okay. And also the way that we always planted them was we ridge the soil up and then what we do you, basically if you're gonna hand set them, you, you dig down about three to four inches and what you wanna do is lay that slip horizontal with mm -hmm. a little piece sticking up like, okay. and, and, and of course bury it. Research has shown that when you plant them horizontally in that row, they produce more sweet potatoes. Right. Now, some people will just dig a big hole straight down and plant the plant vertical, but they tend not to put it on as many potatoes that way. Right. So you want to plant it kind of horizontal. And I would probably say go about uh, 24 inches between each plant, somewhere right. along that line. Mm -hmm. And how long before you can harvest those? Would you? Uh, those are well, probably weighing 100 maybe? Oh, yeah, yeah, 110, 100, 120 10, days, yeah. somewhere along that line you should have some good sweet potatoes. Wow, uh, any specific variety again that you? Oh, if you want to, to me, if you want a real good right. uh, sweet potato pie, <laughs> Bunch Puerto Rico oh, okay. is a that. very good uh, variety. If you're looking for an heirloom variety, the old Centennial. Centennial. Yeah, I've heard it all. Uh, okay. But they tend to have diseases, the Centennials. So, okay. So you'll want to watch those. All right, here's our next via email. Can knockout roses get bagworms? One of our bushes has what looks like bagworms, or it might be a butterfly that has made cocoon. So, Tony, what do you think? Can knockout roses get bagworms? Yes. Of course. It's not bagworms' favorite food, yeah. but they're they're not able to move very quickly <laughs> or rapidly with those that. with those bags around them. Mm -mm. So they'll kind of take what they can get. Mm -hmm. So very opportunistic. So yes, uh -huh. they can get bagworms. I've seen bagworms with just about anything. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, you know, I, I think the research says what over 300 species of plants you can find bagworms. Yes. Yes. So think about that. I've seen them on azaleas, ball mm -hmm. cypress. You know, I've seen them climbing up walls. I've seen them just yes. about everywhere, <laughs> folks. <laughs> uh, I've even had them on my apple trees. Oh, wow. God. Okay. Mm -hmm. wow. I, I've actually had them on my apple trees. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, bagworms would be anywhere. And if they're in your knockout roses, your roses are shrubs are probably not that tall you know what yeah. you do just pull them off yeah, yeah. Right, just pull them off and you'll be just fine but yeah you find those on everything these days over 300 species of plants you can mm -hmm. find back yeah. those things are tough hmm. all right here's our next viewer email the leaves of my holly plants are covered in a black substance what is causing this and what can i do to save the plant and this is from charles right here in memphis let's start out with the first part of this question tanya so what's the black substance on the leaves? It's a fungus called sooty mold. Yeah, yeah. But you don't treat the fungus. But, thank you. Right, because most people when they call the office they say I have the black mold disease. Yes. No. The real problem is insects. It's the real problem. Mm -hmm. And most of the time on hollies, uh, it's probably scale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you'll have an insect problem on your plants and then the insects excrete this sugary sweet substance called honeydew. Mm -hmm and then the sooty mold grows on top of the honeydew. Right. So to get rid of the sooty mold, you gotta get rid of the insects. There you go. And a couple ways you could do that, um, you can use a horticultural oil uh -huh. to coat over the insects so that they cannot, they have um, spiracles on their back that they breathe through. So if you coat those over with oil, they can't breathe, they die. Okay. And then once they die, no more honeydew, no more sooty mold. That's right. And eventually the sooty mold will uh, kind of wear off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you can do that, or I believe imidacloprid as a soil drench around the base of your shrubs or trees will take care of that too. All right, the soil drenches will work. This is a good time to apply those, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. course. Anything so, to add to yeah. that, Walter? Well, no, she's, she's spot on. I have known people to 
go out and wash it off. Yeah. You yeah, know, if you can. Yeah, you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they want their, you know, bed to look pretty. So right. They just wash it off. Mm -hmm. But yeah. But, right. And something else too I like to mention when you're dealing with pests, it's always good to know the life cycle. Yeah. So yeah. which part of the life cycle is the best to control? And it's usually the crawlers. Yes. So if you can control those crawlers, you have more success, mm -hmm. you know, in controlling your scales or aphids or whatever the case may be. So you're exactly right. Mr. Charles, I hope that helps you out. My thing has always been this. Why do they call it honeydew? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's always called uh. honeydew. I always wondered about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, so Walter, tell you we're out of time. Thank you. All right, thank you. It's fun. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org and the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. We now have over 500 videos on familyplotgarden.com. So if you need gardening advice, it's a good place to go. If you can't find the answer, just click on the Ask Us Your Gardening Questions banner and we'll answer it here on the show. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.